Hey, how's it going? This is Chad Haig reporting from Southern India. I wanted to resume the series of videos on Martin Heidegger's Being and Time. Now, of course, on my channel, there's already a first video on the introduction to Being and Time, but I wanted to continue today by delving into Division 1, the preparatory fundamental analysis of Dasein. And I wanted to focus, although I originally intended to do the whole division in this video, on the uh, the first half, roughly, of that, which uh, chapter 1, 2, and 3 will cover. And I'll do the video on the second half of Division 1 tomorrow, on uh, chapters 4, 5, and 6. And I wanted to uh, incorporate this into a larger series of videos on the works of Martin Heidegger. I have been uh, working lately to do some videos on question concerning technology, as well as his uh, lectures on um, phenomenology and religion from like 1920 to 21. So some lectures on Plato and um, you know, in short, a lot of stuff on Heidegger should be coming on the channel, but I really want to start maybe with being in time in that it's difficult to, I think, maybe fully appreciate a lecture on Martin Luther, a lecture on Aristotle, a lecture on um, Parmenides uh, from Heidegger without maybe having the background in being and time, which really provides the magnum opus of Heidegger's thought, although being in time was fragmentary, it was never actually finished. If you look beginning of the work at the original structure that was supposed to, um, you know, that the book was supposed to have as a whole. Obviously, a lot of that later stuff um, either was not written, or if you consider the lecture series to sort of give us that um, material is, is a matter of debate. But um, suffice it to say that it, it's kind of a, a fragmentary magnum opus, and yet it really is a um, an insight into the thought of arguably the most unique thinker of the 20th century, and certainly one of the greatest philosophers of all time. And I want to focus in this video, as I mentioned, on the first couple chapters in which he opens with the distinction between ontological and ontic, which is all too easy to confuse. And in fact, some of the greatest philosophers of all time have done precisely that, the ontological problem of what is being versus the ontic problem of being concerned with particular beings is something that um, might, if it's misunderstood, leads you to think that you can talk about the ontological with the resources that would be appropriate to talk about the ontic. For example, it has been mistaken over the history of philosophy that Dasein might be understood through the categorical framework by which objects that he calls present at hand could be grasped. So the metaphysical biases relevant to an object like a Rubik's Cube, which is a physical thing, which is in this case present at hand in the sense that, as I displayed on the screen, you're not using it, um, you're just sort of staring at it. That is certainly a legitimate way of approaching objects merely present at hand, but the categorical framework which develops over the course of Western philosophy to talk ever more rigorously about that objectivity is simply inapplicable to Dasein because of the difference between ontic things like the Rubik's Cube and um, the problem of the ontological, which is being qua being. And he argues that the search for Dasein and its fundamental essential structures is going to consume division one of being and time. But this structure of Dasein is not something which, even if you did have the individual parts, could be pieced back together even if you had something like a blueprint to tell you how. Rather, the structure of Dasein can only be understood if you already have this notion that Dasein is primordially and constantly whole. Therefore, you cannot reach Dasein through some flawed methodology that would reinterpret Dasein in terms of some notion of substance, which is pretty much what Western tradition has done done with Aristotle, you have substance as, of course, the most basic of the categories. You have higher order categories only insofar 
as they inhere within some substance that provides the basis for them. So you can't have color just floating around without a substance. You only have, for example, color if you have it out of a substance. You only have a measurement like three feet tall if it's a measurement of a substance. And certainly Heidegger acknowledges substance as a legitimate thing to talk about. It's just that it's not the most basic um, level that it was assumed to be. And in fact, you only get this notion of substantiality, um, Heidegger argues, at the end of Division I, if that had to first emerge from an understanding of objective presence, as I mentioned, making something objectively present at hand, like the Rubik's Cube. But that presence is itself founded upon an interpretation. And it's the interpretation of these inner worldly beings that had to already have been discovered, and they had to have been discovered as taken care of. Now, that might sound like a mouthful, and certainly this video and the next will dissect all of those sub-concerns in much greater detail, but it just shows you that the error of thinking that you can understand or even begin to investigate uh, um, Dasein with the assumption of substance is something which itself is founded upon many subtle, I guess you could call them presuppositions. Substance is already founded on um, objective presence. It's already founded on interpretation. It's already founded on, um, on taking care. And all of that will be uh, done in a remarkably insightful and unique way in Division One. So we'll start with Chapter One, the exposition of the task of preparatory analysis of Dasein. And I'm just going to make sure that the streaming is working because of obvious uh, issues that have occurred using a Wi-Fi box. Get a comment from a viewer to consider moving away from the Wi-Fi box issues that have occurred. And OK, it looks like it's working. So um, but uh, I think that uh, spending five dollars a month for Internet rather than a hundred, which is what I used to pay in America, is um, good enough of a deal that we'll just work around it. So anyway, in chapter one, the exposition of the task of preparatory analysis of Dasein, he mentions that Understanding Dasein in terms of existence can only begin if you move beyond the type of equivocation which the word existence has suffered throughout the history of philosophy all the way up to a thinker like Kant, and certainly in the ordinary or common sense understanding of the Western psyche, you have this understanding of existence, which actually just equivocates it with the concept of objective presence. He calls this the Vorhandenheit. In German, for means before. So the idea is if you're just standing before something which is at hand and staring at it and maybe um, not using it so much as just explicitly taking an account of its attributes as a thing in front of you, that's the kind of objective presence which... Um, is not the notion of existence which is applicable to Dasein. So when he talks about Dasein's existence, he doesn't mean it in this common sense notion that we attribute to whether certain seemingly fictional or questionable entities really exist. So we ask questions like, does Bigfoot really exist? That means, can you is there an object out there which could be um, rendered as present at hand that you could actually find Bigfoot and stare at him? Is the, does the Loch Ness Monster exist? And the question of existence is therefore the question, is that an object, um, basically, with a presence? Okay, But he says that Dasein's existence is not that. And in fact, understanding existence beyond this type of presence at hand is going to be key to grasping Dasein, especially for the fact that its essence lies in its existence. Okay. And existence qua Dasein, he will explain later on in Division 2, is going to be tied to Dasein as understanding the potentiality of being, as a being concerned in its being 
about its being. Now that sounds like a typical Heideggerian mouthful, but what this means is existence for Dasein is going to be more a matter of con something which is concerned about its being and therefore already has something like a primordial interpretation of its being as that which it's concerned about. And therefore Dasein's essence is going to lie in its existence in a way that defies many of the traditional ways we have of talking about essences as something maybe fixed, determined, as attached to an object present at hand. For Dasein's essence to lie in its existence as dealing with the potentiality of being and concerned about its being, then the characteristics of Dasein are going to be things which you can talk about. It's not that there are no characteristics of Dasein. It's rather that the characteristics of Dasein will not be found as a list of objective attributes. Rather, the characteristics of Dasein, he says, are going to be more like possible ways to be. And therefore, Dasein really cannot be fit into some broader genus of which it would be the instantiation. The idea in the introduction of whether being is anything like a genus, um, whether it's anything like um, a region, as it would be for Husserl, you have these material regions, like the region of physical objects, the region of, um, of, uh, of psychic events, the region of consciousness itself, which ironically constitutes its own um, psychic self transcendentally, etc. cetera. Um, Dasein is not one of those. Dasein is not a Husserlian region. Dasein is not a genus in which the, um, the, the being concerned about its being would just be one instantiation in the sense that, you know, human beings are uh, something like a species and Socrates and Aristotle and Thales are all just instantiations of it. Rather, if you lose the genus, Dasein has to be my own. And therefore, the kinds of being of Dasein that he lists are, include the um, the level of authenticity and the level of inauthenticity. But inauthenticity must not be misinterpreted as a lower degree of being. You shouldn't think that that just means that you have less being. It's rather that in dealing with the, the two characteristics of Dasein, as the priority of existentia over essentia in traditional existentialism, this means that you kind of have to exist before you have a sense of what you are or who you are. So in existentialism, traditionally, you have to exist without a type of blueprint to tell you what you are as something fixed. And I'm not saying that that's necessarily what Heidegger means here, but this notion of existentia over essentia certainly is important for him. But all, also the question of always being my own is something you're going to have to um, accept if you take this definition. Therefore, the traditional categories of objectivity for Western philosophy, for example, in Aristotle's substance, quality, quantity, relation, place, regardless of whether that's the exact order it's, it's put in for one philosopher to the next. These are some of the categories in which you might be able to make a, an infinite number of different statements about a, a thing, but there's certain um, general headings under which any sensible statement is going to fall. And these, they include, you know, substance, quality, quantity, relation, etc. cetera. Um, but that of course presupposes that you're dealing with something which is an object present at hand, like this Greek vase depicting the goddess Artemis. But Dasein is not such a type of being. And although there are several ways to talk about this distinction, one which is quite important is the difference between a what and a who. However, you must be careful not to mistake that as equating Dasein with the notion of a life or the notion of a person. Um, in fact, we don't exactly have a shortage of concerns about life or persons or subjectivity. And in fact, Descartes was in some sense kind of sufficiently concerned, that's what that should say, by the way, sorry for the typo, with the criteria of um, a thinking subject or with a person. And he was concerned with the cogito part of that formula, but he 
did not consider the sum part of the formula adequately. And that's going to be the difference between Heidegger and Descartes, as Heidegger himself understands it, as Heidegger will focus more on, if you speak Latin, cogito ergo sum is, you know, I, um, um, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore, I am. He didn't focus enough on the I am part. And in this text, likewise, Dasein will be treated in its uniqueness by focusing on every Danish. But this must not be interpreted as some primitive stage of Dasein. And in fact, the apparent distinction between the primitive and the high levels of cultural manifestation is something which, precisely in the era where a mountain of anthropological data had gotten pretty good at archiving lots of data about that, the irony was that this proliferation of world images missed the fact that some implicit idea of a world must already be a prerequisite for the ordering of all of those images. We had gotten pretty good, in other words, at archiving world images, but in the mix of it, we had lost sight of the importance of inquiring into what a world is. But of course, as chapter two goes, being in the world in general is fundamental constitution of Dasein. Being in the world is a, like I mentioned earlier, a unified phenomenon, which cannot be broken up into pieces. And yet it still does make sense to talk about it having certain constitutional structural factors. But we must be careful not to equivocate the way that the um, being in the world might be misrecognized through metaphors of other ways of being in. For example, we must not equivocate the way that he says water is in a glass, or in my image, a good Guinness stout is in a glass, with the way that Dasein is in the world, because the assumption that water is in the glass is the definition of in, has this implicit idea that you're talking about a relation between two objects. But of course, Dasein and the world are not two objects. And the relation of in-ness here is not one of adjacency. It's not one of having the two be close enough that they can touch. In fact, even with objects ordinarily considered, you don't really achieve the, the um, phenomenon of a touch if you reduce distance. For example, a chair and a wall could be reduced the interval between them to zero, and yet they still wouldn't be able to have the phenomenon of a touch, because that is something which you get rather from a type of being which is not that of the chair. Therefore, you have to talk about the existentials, as I um, uh, was bringing up the categorials a moment ago to distinguish them from the existentials, and I'll just revisit that real quick. You have categories for an object, and you have existentials for Dasein because you cannot understand Dasein with the categorical framework of substance, quality, quantity, relation, but that doesn't mean that you can't approach Dasein with certain fundamental um, factors, and the existentials of Dasein is going, are going to accomplish that for you. And one of these existentials is being in. And we have to not understand that with the type of uh, in-ness that uh, the categorical of an object would give you, because um, the ontological in principle, cannot be further clarified by an ontic characteristic in the sense that existential being in is not categorical insideness. Being in is rather something which is founded in um, this, sorry, is uh, mistyped, in which being together with is grounded. So it's, it's something for which being together with is another concern in which the groundedness of the types of concerns of Dasein are going to present a framework simply irreducible to even a much clearer understanding of a particular ontic characteristic. Therefore, world must already be discovered. And it must already be discovered in terms of which beings can reveal themselves. And a simply objectively present object, like a shovel, therefore, is not so much in a world, 
in the way Dasein is, as it's worldless, because the kind of world which Heidegger's interested in here is the one in which there's a possibility of a discoveredness and a revealedness, which has to go back to the disclosure of Dasein as something not only as within, metaphorically, like a clearing in the woods, but as itself that clearing, as I'll focus on in the next video on the second half of Division One. Therefore, Dasein's facticity, although very important, must not be misunderstood to be like the factuality of a stone. Those are simply different things. Therefore, being in is not this optional action, which is sometimes done and sometimes not done. Dasein's relation to the world is not one of standing over against it. It's not a relation of a subject encountering an object. Dasein certainly does know the world, but this knowing must not be thought of as some interior activity unfolding within a subjective box. Rather, Dasein's knowing is a mode of Dasein's being in the world. And a recurring emphasis throughout the book, if I were to maybe give you one of the most important um, recurring words in the whole book, is already. So knowing is grounded in already being in the world, because Dasein is already outside in the world. It doesn't have a mind that, well, let me put it this way, it doesn't leave the mind in order to go find a fact in the world and then return back to the mind with the fact. It's rather that this knowing, if you're even talking about it, you're already in a certain sense talking about being in the world. And if you're talking about it, you're also um, implicitly talking about Dasein being on the outside in the world, rather than having consciousness unfold in the interiority of a perception that focuses on ideas, as I'll talk about in greater detail later. Therefore, already being with must not be misunderstood as a type of staring at objects as present at hand. Rather, this being with is taken in by the world, and it's absorbed in taking care. And the ways of being in will include things like taking care of things. For example, the peasant who is uh, absorbed in the work in the field, in taking care of farming tasks, etc. Um, is somebody who's taken in by that world and absorbed in that taking care. And um, absorbed in using things like the shovel and the potato fork and the... Um, the, uh, the woodworking tools, and it's uh, absorbed in uh, accomplishing and in searching and finding things. Therefore, Dasein, ontologically understood, is care. This is in um, English, maybe, <coughs> excuse me, a little more ambiguous than it might be, <coughs> excuse me, in other languages. In German, you have Zorba. In Latin, you have Cura. And it's being towards the world is taking care of stuff basically, is a kind of very informal way to put it. And the Cartesian model, which tends to think of the subject's relation to the world as a type of perception, in the sense that for Descartes, it's assumed that the default mode is one of perceiving. And of course, if you're perceiving, the correlate of that is the idea, which in original etymological purposes really means something kind of like a picture. For Descartes, the ideas are basically pictures. Some of them are innate, you know, in other words, some some truths for Descartes are free. You don't have to go out and work to get them, like two plus two equals four. Um, they're, they're innate ideas you already have. But Descartes still uh, assumes that perception in which the mind is occupied with an idea, which comes to be the unquestioned model for the empiricists, no matter how much they differ from each other. John Locke assumes that the idea is an intermediary between a subject with a mind and an object with substance underlying the idea. Barclay radicalizes that by saying, well, no, there's no objects or substances. There's just minds and ideas. And the only reason that you know, the ideas don't vanish when particular minds die is because the ultimate mind, God, is always um, busied with all of the ideas and sustaining them. <coughs> Excuse me. And David Hume radicalized both by saying that um, the there's neither a mind 
nor is there um, a substance. There's just ideas. And the mind is like a river with, that, with no riverbed. It's just a stream of fleeting ideas. But they all left unquestioned the idea that perception, busied with an idea, is a fundamental starting point. And this is exactly what Heidegger is going to challenge because that attitude misses the point that perception presupposes interpretation. And the reason perception already presupposes that Dasein is busy with interpretation is that perception is already addressing something as something. And therefore, you don't know it, but with perception, you're already talking about interpretation. And therefore, in chapter three, the worldliness of the world, he's going to move away from this Cartesian model of an interior stream of consciousness by a subject who encounters the world in the medium primarily of an idea to talk about the way that the very question whether world is common to all or subjective for each misses the distinction between the ontic world of a totality of present things, the, the mundane definition of the world is that, versus the world as a characteristic of Dasein itself, and in that case, worldliness as existential. Uh, world is not some exterior thing, which Dasein itself is not. As I mentioned, it's not a relation between two objects, Dasein and world. It's not a relation between subject and exterior object, Dasein and world. Rather, if you really think about those objectively present things themselves, you're already assuming that they belong to a world. And therefore, they are, in a certain sense, encountered as innerworldly. Okay, this is going to be the big thing, at least in the uh, Shtamba, I think is how you, uh, the translator's pronunciation, um, in that translation um, that I've been using. So the discovery of nature, for example, which the natural scientist considers to be absolutely fundamental, is itself, I mean, certainly legitimate, you can do it, but the discovery of nature as nature is a type of de-worlding of that world. And when you talk about the associations with those innerworldly things, it's not primarily a matter of perceptual cognition, okay, as Descartes, David Hume, John Locke, and Barclay assumed. It's rather that the closest kind of association that you find dealing with the innerworldly is in things like handling, things like using, things like taking care. Dasein has no need, however, to explicitly get into everyday Dasein. Um, get into this because every day Dasein already is in this way. The classic example, which um, uh, Dreyfus, for example, is fond of, is the doorknob. And he mentions to his students at Berkeley that, well, this morning when you woke up and uh, left your dorm room and came to campus, you had to turn a doorknob to leave your dorm and come to class. But I'm guessing none of you actually remember doing it because unless the doorknob had a problem, um, for example, it was broken or it was locked and you didn't have the key. Um, you didn't experience, so to speak, that doorknob as an object which was perceived in the medium of an idea as present at hand. Um, you used it. And if it functioned smoothly and properly, you, you know, this is controversial, but you unproblematically used it. And there was no need to explicitly get into that relation or that way of approaching it, I should say. Because Dasein, as everyday Dasein, already is in this way. So in taking care, useful things are encountered as ready at hand. The German Zuhandenheit versus the German Vorhandenheit. It's kind of the distinction at the beginning between, um, between two and four, uh, before. So when it's present at hand, it's something which you're standing before and staring at. But when it's ready at hand, which is a translation I really like, um, you have things available for involvement in the types of taking care of tasks, for lack of a better word, which Dasein is already busy with. And the thing you got to keep in mind about considering something like a doorknob as a useful thing ready at hand and available for use, is that there actually is no such thing as a useful thing in the singular. There are useful things, but they are useful only insofar as the in order to of the useful 
given, uh, the useful is given with a totality of useful things, with a reference of something to something. And it's not that you examine them one at a time and then build up this totality of um, of, uh, of relevance or whatever. Um, it's rather that the totality is discovered before the one. And therefore, this big emphasis on circumspection is going to consume a lot of the third chapter. And let me just make sure. And therefore, this okay. big emphasis... Okay, and there's a comment. I'll just check that out real consume quick. ...consume a lot of the third chapter. And Looking forward to watching after finals. Okay, yeah, great. Uh, thank you for watching... And uh, the rest of the videos will be coming soon. Sorry for the delay. Um, hopefully the full book will be um, talked about uh, very soon here. But uh, so perception of the idea versus use is something for which the less that we stare at the hammer, the more we actively use it, the more original relation. And the more, ironically enough, the hammer is encountered as what it actually is, which is a useful thing. So you have to distinguish handiness from mere occurrence. The irony that we thought we would get a, a, a more original encountering of the hammer as what it really is by staring at it and doing an investigation of its attributes. Um, the irony is that we actually get closer to what the hammer is as a useful thing by not doing that. And therefore, circumspection is the kind of scene which accommodates the manifold references of the in order to. And if you want to talk about what this other attitude is, this attitude of theoretical behavior, because the ancient Greek word for, um, for theoria is largely related to a type of looking at. So theoretical behavior literally is just looking at. Okay. And that is something which obviously you can do, but you do it as non-circumspectly, okay? So in a certain sense, if you're doing the theoretical behavior of staring at it as a type of perception of an idea, you're actually breaking with the circumspection that is the kind of scene that would rather accommodate that hammer into the manifold references of this in order to and dealing with the totality. Handiness, therefore, must not be understood as some aspects which are um, discursively forced upon things, already encountered, objectively present, and then submitted to a type of subjective coloring, which is the attitude you might normally have about um, dealing with, with, with stuff. The world, similarly, is already presupposed, and the world is not this result of concatenating all of the objects in the world. It's not that you start inductively with one object and you add another and another and another until you build up the world as a sum total. Rather, the world, in order to even begin talking about one object, was already presupposed. Okay. But the difference between unreadiness at hand and readiness at hand, or the notion of the, the unusability of some of that otherwise useful stuff. For example, the classic example of a hammer which is too heavy to lift. Maybe a hammer which is broken, like the one I showed. Um, it has to be built in the understanding that a tool is discovered as unready in hand, not by listing its attributes, but in the associations of its use. So the reference of the in order to, to the what for, if that has been disturbed, this disruption will make the reference explicit, ironically enough, and yet you still have to understand this type of thing as a deviation from, circum from the type of um, uh, smoothly functioning totality of, um, of useful stuff. So anyway, this leads to an under uh, talk about science. Now, understanding is going to uh, be talked about a lot more in the second half of Division One, but I want to talk about as foundationalists taking care is, it always already occurs on the basis of a certain familiarity with the world, as the world which does and was always already in. The world had to already be disclosed, as we talked in the first video about the metaphor of a clearing in the woods. Dasein is not the stuff in the clearing which has been disclosed. Dasein is the clearing. That'll be um, focused on much more in the second half. But in the context of the world, Dasein 
was always already in the world. And the world had to be disclosed in general in order to appear in a certain way in the first place. And signs, therefore, are very particular types of useful things. Because a sign lets what is at hand be encountered. And they're useful things that bring a whole totality of useful things to circumspection. He gives the example of a boundary stone, um, like the one that I have on the screen. He gives the example of signs of mourning. These are the Hindu signs of mourning in color is white. In the West, of course, the color in mourning is black. Um, but signs um, bring the totality to circumspection as themselves useful things. And his theory of signs is really interesting in light of his later views on language. That would probably deserve a whole another video to, um, to talk about in much greater detail. But for now, I'll focus on the way that usability is a kind of relevance of X's being together with Y's or whatever. But Dasein had to have the kind of being that always already lets something be freed up for relevance in order to even begin to talk about those associations. Therefore, in understanding, Dasein can signify to itself because of the priority which understanding has within his um, view of Dasein. Significance can be considered like a relational totality of signification, which constitutes a structure of a world. Because Dasein as understanding and interpreting discloses the significations which found the very possibility of words and language. Disclosed significance, in other words, precedes the discovery of a totality of relevance. Now that's a mouthful, but what he means here is that talking about words and language as would be the foundation of trying to understand um, things like rationality misses the point that words and language had to already be founded in their possibility upon Dasein's disclosure of significations. And that, in, in turn, leads you to have to focus on understanding and interpretation in a way that I already mentioned, like Cartesian perception of an idea already presupposes a type of interpretation or whatever of something as something. And to get back to Descartes, who is, of course, a big uh, object of critique in this chapter, the contrast between Heidegger and Descartes is one of the most fundamental ways to understand who Heidegger is. So he devotes some time to Descartes' theories per se. Of course, for Descartes, spatiality is identical with extension. He mentions that the world is itself res extensa. That is to say, um, the world understood spatially simply is this extension. And that's because um, other seemingly independent properties are also themselves just modes of extension. For example, for Descartes, motion, um, color, hardness, these are modes of extension. And this is because of the difference in types of substance between, um, for him, there's an infinite substance, which is God, and then there's two finite types of substances, which are res cogitans, which is the mind, the thinking thing in Latin, and the res extensa, which is the extended thing, or what might be called like um, the body uh, that's related to the mind. But of course, the world itself is res extensa. And Descartes gets this notion that the substance of res extensa has to be understood primarily in terms of extension because of his definition of substance as independence. So for Descartes, the irony about substance is it underlies all the properties, and yet you cannot access substance as property because if you were, you'd be dealing with the property rather than the substance. So the way of deducing substance's existence is rather, I would argue, logically through the notion of independence. For Descartes, something is a substance insofar as it's independent and it needs no other thing to exist. And this gets adopted by Spinoza later in the ethics to say that, well, if substance is that which needs no other thing to exist, then the requirements for substance are so rigorous that there's only one substance, and that substance is God. And yet substance as God for Spinoza is not like the, the personal God who's in another realm and concerned about all of us. So much as substance as God is kind of just, you know, in a certain sense, everything. There's, n there's not many, many things. There's only one thing. In a certain sense, we're all, I guess, relationally, ethically bound as relations within that one substance. But that's Spinoza. For now, let's talk about how this opens up a renewal of the medieval ontological problem in which 
if you establish that God is, and you establish that man is in the Middle Ages, in scholastic philosophy, that creates a very big problem for being, because obviously the being of God cannot be the same as the being for man despite the fact that you have to use the same word to talk about both. But for Descartes, the substance fallacy is just continued because something ontic, like substance, he, he presumes, must underlie the ontological. In other words, this problematization of being between God and man, which you find in medieval scholastic philosophy, is solved by Descartes just by relying on something ontic, underlying the ontological, and that is substance, which of course you only get as I mentioned at the beginning, as I'll just go right back real quick, um, you only get substance if you get it from an understanding of objective presence, which you only get from an interpretation of innerworldly beings, which you only get as discovered and taken care of. And that's the mistake that Descartes continues. And for him to say that um, um, making God one type of substance and the other two types of substance different does not solve that. But anyway, he still thinks that the thing is initially material and then it gets stamped with the value basically. And his understanding of space is going to follow this logic and it's going to differ radically from Heidegger's notion of Dasein spatiality in being in time. But we all know the Cartesian coordinate system in the sense that when I talk about the Cartesian coordinate system, I'm literally talking about the Cartesian coordinate system. When you learn in middle school about the isomorphism between a pair of numbers like, I don't know, let's see, like one and looks like 20 is on this graph and a location on a graph, Descartes really discovered that the same meaning can be expressed either as a pair of numbers or as a location on a graph. And the question, which is it intrinsically, is put put aside. It's, it's, it's enough to discover that isomorphism, which Descartes apparently discovered while lying in bed and watching a spider climb on the roof and realizing that the spider was changing its location on the roof by increasing and decreasing the numerical um, its numerical position on the y and x um, 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 sets of court or a set of numbers, whatever. But of course, Cartesian space within this understanding is a set of neutral locations. And you can express distance within this set of abstract neutral locations according to a unit of measurement. For example, here's one, here's two, here's three. And that assumes, of course, that the unit of measurement must be uniform and abstract. If it's uniform, then um, two is simply twice as big as one. Okay. If it's abstract, then it doesn't matter what you're measuring. Anything in there will still be submittable to this. And that's how we've gotten used to think about. But of course, the aroundness of the surrounding world for Dasein and the spatiality of Dasein will not be obedient to that type of understanding of spatiality. Because in its everyday association at hand, nearness is actually not found by measuring distances according to one abstract standard unit. Because in contrast with observational measurements of space, Dasein deals with pathways of everyday associations. And rather than make observations about the distance at which intervals separate things from other things, Dasein is concerned about how things have their place with aware. And this is accounted for by taking care and by orienting them to other handy things within a totality. Therefore, you do not find the thing in its place. Um, excuse me. Therefore, if you don't find the thing in its place, then that makes the region explicit. But otherwise, you're not dealing with something like the kind of coordinate system that Descartes would envision. Dasein does not exist in an abstract vacuum of empty space, in other words, that is only secondarily populated by stuff. As concerned about its being, Dasein has discovered beforehand the regions in their decisive relevance, determined by the totality of relevance by which the ready at hand is set free as encountered. This encountering of the ready at hand in its place is ontically possible because Dasein is spatial with regard to its very being within the world. So therefore, Dasein does have a spatiality. It's just not the Cartesian one because Dasein is not like in a position in space and it's not encountering the, the world in terms of um, relating to certain um, explicit intervals of distance to things that it's concerned about. Rather, the world as familiar, heedful association with beings encountered in a world is going to be 
Um, so it, it allow you that um, to talk about Dasein's tendency towards de-distancing. The older translation calls this deseverencing. Um, but that's only because Dasein is essentially de-distancing with regard to its world. And it's de-distancing essentially as allowing beings to, to be encountered in nearness. So what this means is that Dasein does have an essential de-distancing with regard to the encounter, but that is in order to bring nearness rather than being on the basis of some abstract set of calculations with regard to a definite unit of measurement. Therefore, the spatiality of Dasein, <coughs> excuse me, lies on the basis of Dasein's being in. But being in has also the character of de-distancing and directionality, the two big things with Heidegger spatiality. Remoteness is something you can talk about for objects, but that's categorical. De-distancing is existential and not remoteness per se. Therefore, de-distancing is understood on the basis of a circumspective approaching, bringing near to hand. But this does not amount to eating up intervals between definite points in a graph. For example, it's not like going from here to here, okay, explicitly. For example, something might be interval, uh, might lie within an interval of a very short distance away from, say, you. But it could still be distant if it's not discovered, not available, etc. For example, if you're glasses are on your nose, but you don't know that they're on your nose, they are not near, okay? So bringing near and taking care does not mean fixing upon position in space relative to the body. Nearness is what is in range of what is at hand for circumspection. And of course, the later Heidegger will talk about how nearness is achieved by um, language, okay? The word brings nearness, but that's a whole nother video. So to finish spatiality and Dasein, um, as being in the world, Dasein essentially dwells in this de-distancing and with a character of directionality guided beforehand by its circumspection of heedfulness. So with regard to Dasein's directionality, left and right are directions that we normally associate, uh, we normally assume to be the center of a talk of direction. But those directions emerge out of Dasein's directionality. And if Dasein is, it's always already directing and de-distancing in its discovered region. The a priori directionality is grounded in being in the world. It is not grounded in the abstraction of a worldless subject. Okay? So giving space means letting something be encountered. This type of space is not in the subject. This isn't the Kantian idea that, you know, space is not out there. It's just sort of subjectively um, projected um, as a transcendental grid of locations. It's rather that you can only understand space, Heidegger says, if you go back to the world. And it looks like um, that is the end of the first half of um, being in time, the uh, first division. Now, tomorrow I will continue. The first half of. And everyone, uh, thank you for watching. This will finish this video. And uh, and uh, anyway, so <laughs> sorry, I got distracted for a second there by um, notification on YouTube. The uh, benefits of social media and its constant distraction um anyway the uh the videos on question concerning technology as well as the essays within the question concerning technology by heidegger will be coming up very soon as well as heidegger's lectures on phenomenology of religion on um plato and on hegel's phenomenology of spirit so thank you for watching